What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Dreamers Mentality Podcast. We're here today with Kyle Garland. He's a decathlete at the University of Georgia. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. So just a little bit about Kyle to start. Um, so Kyle was a 2018 IAAF World Junior Team member. Um, he was the 2020 SEC Freshman of the Year. He finished sixth at the Olympic Trials in the decathlon this past year. Um, and he was the 2021 SEC Champion in both the heptathlon and the decathlon indoors and outdoors. So quite the accomplished guy, quite the athlete we got here. Um, so thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me, y'all. Yeah, so just, um, I kind of want to get it started with um, saying a little bit of what Kyle means to me. <laughs> so for anyone that knows me, um, you know that um, Kyle's been a good motivator for me in my life um, as one of the top decathletes um, who also have has experienced some injuries throughout his career. And obviously he's had massive success with his uh, sport so far, and he's nowhere near done. Um, just a great guy for me to look up to. And so I really appreciate you hopping on and getting the chance to talk to us. Yeah, man, for sure. All right, so I think uh, we can start this off by uh, just talking about some, like, mentality questions. And one thing we wanted to ask you was, how was your experience at the 2020 um, Olympic trials? Man, it was it was a lot of fun out there. I mean, it was, definitely was a little overwhelming at first. I got in there and, you know, seeing a bunch of different people that I had looked up to, um, growing up in this sport and specifically in the decathlon and being able to be in that same competition and compete against them. It kind of was like, felt a little starstruck at the, at the beginning of competition. But once I got in, once I got in the flow, stepped on that track and got out there in, in Hayward field, you know, I mean, I just kind of felt like I was at home. I felt like this is where I was meant to be. And, you know, a lot of people hear about Hayward magic. I mean, it's, it's definitely real that, that energy that you feel yes, when you're in there, even the crowd, just like hyping everybody up and, Everybody out there in, in Eugene, Tracktown, USA knows track and field very well. So just having fans that yeah. are fully engaged, you know, it was a it was a great experience and definitely a lot to learn from. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I feel like <clears throat> when I um, started like throwing uh, this year, um, at, you know, the Division One level, just like throwing against some of these guys I've like seen on Instagram and stuff, and like <laughs> like damn, like now I'm like with these guys, you know what I mean? So. And I can't imagine what it's like at that level, then. Like, you get to the trials, and you're with these pros that you haven't competed with. Like, you always see the guys in college that you get to compete against, but now you're with, like, you know, the really big guys and right. stuff, which is, like, you know, probably a different type of feeling. And, you know, I, I can't imagine what it's like now out in Tokyo having, like, no fans and stuff, mm -hmm. honestly, because I'm sure, like, Hayward is electric with fans. Yeah. Like, you probably it's a different feeling. And right. It sucks that there's no one out there watching, but, you know, yeah, I can't wait to be out of Hayward. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, um, one other thing that I kind of want to ask you about a little bit is how much of a difference it made going with um, Petros coaching staff, every everyone at Georgia who kind of um, helped you make the decisions um, heading into the the meet. Um, like how, how much of that preparation, your teammates obviously went to Anna Hall. Um, how much of that, uh, that whole team behind you, how, how did that play into uh, the success you had at trials and um, what you ended up doing there? It was definitely huge success. I mean, me and my team were less of just teammates and a lot more family. I mean, mm -hmm. we we are with each other day in and day out. It's like an everyday thing. Like, we don't just go to practice and it's just like one or two people out there. Everybody's out there at the same time. Everybody's grinding, motivating each other. So mm -hmm. just being able to hear them and walk over into the stands and see people that I train with every day, people that know me <clears throat> on a very personal level, <clears throat> excuse me, just to – be able to see them and have them motivate me, not not just in practice, but in a setting where it's the biggest meet of my life to date. So it was it was great leading up to to the meet, the preparation, working with Petros and working with just them alongside Petros and everything. I mean, it was I, I'm still kind of speechless of the whole situation. It was just like kind of overwhelming, kind of incredible. I mean, and. The yeah. results. The results showed. I mean, although I suffered a little bit of a hamstring injury um, at that meet, um, the results still showed. I still had a great first day and a solid second day too to put up a really big score. So it was fun. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you, yeah. So you mentioned injuries. Um, and so one thing that we were wondering about, based on that, was kind of the decision process um, leading up to the trials and uh, the decision to forego the NCAA. Um, the Catalan Championship. Right. Um, I know obviously that's a huge meet. Um, something that's probably really big too is a huge decision to miss out on that. But mm -hmm. 
it ended up probably being being the right move. Yeah. Granted the injuries and everything else. Right. It definitely was a tough decision. It was a decision that I had to kind of make um, partly by myself, but also with my coaches and my trainers. Um, I decided that I was going to make the decision to fully trust them and trust that they had a really good plan for me, a rehab plan and just a training plan leading up to that meet. Um, I had hurt my hamstring uh, early April um, at our home meet, Spectown Invitational, um, in the 100-meter dash, and I just wasn't able to compete throughout the remainder of the um, the remainder of the outdoor season until we got to SECs anyway. So it was just kind of really knowing that the plan that my trainers and my coach put together for me was a plan that was going to get me to being back to 100% and getting back to be able to put up really good numbers. So definitely was a tough decision to forego NCAA championships just because this was my first full outdoor season and not being able to do NCAAs is kind of disappointing. But the turnaround from NCAAs to trials, which was only seven days, was definitely not enough to fully recover. So, I mean, it was it was the smartest decision. It was, in in part, I'd say it was a professional decision, and that's the that's the level I'm looking to to get to very soon. So, making professional decisions now is, is probably the smartest thing to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think like that's like a perfect mentality thing about it. I mean, you have a professional career in track and field ahead of you, mm-hmm. and also just in the real world, you know, making decisions like that is you know big. Right. But um. Yeah, one thing I want to touch on there is, like, you know, your coaches and your trainer's decision there is probably, like, you know, they, I think how I look at it is, like, my coach and my trainer, they probably know what's best for me and stuff, too. Yeah. And, like, I think that's huge. So I'm sure Georgia is, you know, has great trainers. And, like, we have great trainers at Wake, so I'm sure you guys have great trainers. So they 100% know what's best for you. They know. Right. Obviously, the turnaround time is not good. So I think it was a great decision by them, honestly, to, you know, just go for it, you know? Yeah, man. And obviously, I'm sure you, you know, said, you know, screw it. It's let's all, let's go all in and just try to make it. For so, sure. you know. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I can touch on that a little bit just in terms of my aspect from having, having so many injuries. It's <clears throat> like you talked about, a lot of it is comes from the training staff and your coaches and the decisions they want to make. But at the end of the day, it is, it does, it does come down to what you want to do. Um, the meets where you want to dedicate your efforts and uh, really put it out there. Mm-hmm. So, Obviously, full full respect for for the decision you made, and obviously it, it it paid off. You had an amazing first day. You suffered a bit of an injury, I, I think, um, which was unfortunate. But I mean, you got a great future ahead of you, so it's, appreciate it's, it. It's definitely coming. Yeah, so sure. transitioning a little bit, um, we we were wondering a little bit. So who who inspired you to initially do the decathlon, um, and where do you kind of look to um, in that sense, like through, throughout the greats? Like who who do you look to for your inspiration when it comes to the decathlon? Um. I was not always doing decathlon. Um, I started track and field at seven years old, and I was doing mainly sprints. um, And then I started doing some high jump stuff when I was in sixth grade. But um, I was at a regionals meet or a district meet in um, 2014, and one of the officials was like, dude, you're doing all these events. I mean, why don't you try the multi, which was (laughs) a pentathlon at the time? And and I was like, I don't even know what this is. I mean, why not try it? I love doing events, so why not get to learn new stuff? So. I was waved into the regionals meet and I won regionals in the pent and then went on the junior Olympics and finished fifth. And I kind of was like, mm, maybe I can, I can do some of this. Maybe I can take it a little bit further. So I started doing decathlon and really started doing research. And once I actually started learning what the decathlon really was outside of it, just being a track and field event, started doing a lot of studying. And I, I came across guys like Ashton Eaton and, and I mean, at the time he was the world record holder with 9,045 points. And it, I mean, that kind of just sparked my my fire to really want to do the decathlon because I was like, one day I want to be a world record holder. One day I want to be like him. And then a few years later, it gets to 2018, and uh, Kevin Mayer surpasses his world record and scores 91-26. So, I mean, just looking at those guys, the guys that have surpassed um, 9,000 points in Roman Severle, Ashton Eaton, and Kevin Mayer, those are the three guys that I really look at. They all have different strong suits um, that I can kind of attribute my type of training style and competition style. And like I model myself after them in little ways and take all sorts of what they have done over the years and kind of put it together to make it my own and to, to excel. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a super, super unique perspective. I think um, it's interesting though, that you, you'd say you, you started um, looking at Ashton Eaton first, because I wouldn't necessarily say your style models after his the most because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Ashley he, he kind of came in he changed the game a little bit right. I think because um, he can he came in and he 
he kind of made it a jumper sprinter game. All right. Um, obviously, economically, points-wise, it's, it's the move to do. But but looking at looking at your abilities, you seem a little bit more spread out, um, a little bit more modeled after mm -hmm. Kevin Meyer. But it, it is an interesting perspective to hear that that um, Ash Neaton was one of your first mentors at right. Decathlon. Yeah, man. I think I think he became one of my first mentors just because he was the world record holder at the time. And I yeah, mean, he absolutely. he was even though he had some marks that were not world class, like his four hundred or forty five. Uh, flat guy and running ten two and everything, but he was mm -hmm. he was the the guy to shoot for because he he was the world record holder and the second guy ever to score over nine thousand points. So I mean, I was just a guy that looked at him and yeah, of course he definitely models his way of competition after sprinting and and jumping. Um, and I know that's very important because those are high scoring point events. But at the same time, to to exceed him, I know that I'm going to have to maintain all the way across the board. I'm going to be able to have have to have a really good second day in all the events. I'm going to have to make sure my strength stays right for my throws and I'm still able to vault and run a solid 15. So, I mean, knowing what I want to do and that goal is to break a world re record eventually down the road, I'm going to have to stay well-rounded but still be able to be world-class in certain events. Yeah, definitely. I mean, well, if you keep on cleaning 330, then <laughs> shit, I think you're out of shop. It will be just fine. But, yeah, um, honestly, though, uh, one thing I was going to say is, where, when you were uh, fifth at that J.O. meet, where was the J.O. meet? Do you remember? The J.O. meet. Um, it was, I'm blanking right now. I think it was in, like, uh, honestly, might have been in, like, I probably, Des Moines, Iowa or something, I think. I, dude, I think I was there. I, like, <laughs> I, you know, this is the crazy part. Is like, I've probably been to so many places that you've been. Like, That's being funny. from Pennsylvania, yeah. we've probably been to the same meets. Probably. Same, probably. like, like same J.O. stuff. Definitely uh -huh. same J.O. stuff. Right. Like, so, probably same region, honestly. Yeah. We're probably, you were probably a widener all those meets. Yeah. So. All the time. Yeah, so, like, yeah. <laughs> That's and, hilarious. You were the same place. That's I mean, I remember man. losing to you at Lehigh, but. <laughs> That was that's a whole different story. That's hilarious. So, yeah, um, I was probably somewhere getting physical therapy for something. <laughs> yeah, you were probably getting physical therapy, honest. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, talking about physical therapy injuries, let's go to your UCL injury or whatever it was the elbow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, how did you uh, how did you PR in that pole vault after you got, you uh, got that injury? Um, it definitely was tough. Um, it took a lot of, a lot of rehab. I was kind of down for a while. I mean, for about a week and a half to two weeks after I had that surgery, I kind of really didn't want to leave my room. I was kind of upset. I mean, I wouldn't say I was like depressed, but I was extremely mm -hmm. upset. And I just kind of like started to lose my love for the sport a little bit. And was kind of just like, what's the purpose? I, I, was, I had suffered a good amount of injuries prior to having the Tommy John surgery in my elbow. So it was just kind of like, what's the point? Like, I'm going to get healthy and then there's just going to be another injury right afterwards. But something inside of me told me to, to stay positive and to keep my drive and my energy flowing because there's going to be something greater that comes from <clears throat> rehabbing this injury and getting myself back to 100%, both with body maintenance and with my elbow. So, I mean, I just kind of <clears throat> kept my mindset focused on the goal. And I mean, in the end of the day, I knew that I still wanted to be an Olympic decathlete down the road and I still wanted to be the greatest to ever do it, have that title. And that's what kind of drove me. I mean, going into that <clears throat> meet, it was kind of tough <clears throat> to get back to vault. It kind of took me a while just because of planting the pole and everything. It's a lot of stress on this elbow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. But um, just being able to stay mentally focused on, on the task at hand and knowing that there's something greater at the end. I mean, it was able to keep me driven, keep me focused. And when I was able to actually get a pole back in my hand, the the progression was, was actually pretty easy because in my off time, I was doing a lot of studying, learning a lot of new cues that I haven't had before. And once I was able to actually translate it into being actually d going down a pole vault runway and plant my pole in the box and being able to take it up, it all, it all clicked at once. Yeah, so honestly, um, quick story time. So the reason um, I first reached out to Kyle and why he, he became a, a pretty big mentor for me was um, I saw that he had gone through the UCL surgery, obviously a pretty big surgery, very similar to something that I'm going through currently. Um, and I saw that he came back, he, he PR'd in his pole on like the first meet back. I was like, damn, how'd that kid do that? Like, like I need to go do that. Like when mm -hmm. I'm back from this, like that's what I need to go out and do. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember this actually, but the first conversation I had with you, I, I kind of asked you a little bit about, about 
your mentality and how you how you mentally were able to stay in your events. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you brought up to me, which I'm not sure if you remember, I think you told me to find like little little tasks that you do. So I think yours was juggling, if I'm not yeah. wrong. Yeah. Does that, does that ring a bell? Yeah. Okay, you told me that <laughs> you said you said you would you would juggle every day, and that kind of like helped you keep your mind sharp. Uh -huh. So I, I kind of took I took to that. Like I did like little things like that, where every day would challenge me mentally. Right. Um, and that's completely aside from thinking about my events, studying them, watching videos, whatever it would be. Completely aside, that was just the mental challenge of me dealing with something that I knew at the end of the day was going to make me a mentally stronger person, mm -hmm. which I really took to heart when you told me that. So <laughs> I'm not sure if you have anything else to say about that, but I just wanted to say yeah, thank you for giving me that piece of advice. That's actually, that's I actually think about really that a lot, actually. Just because um, I just, like, I had known how to juggle before I had my surgery, like I learned when I was really young. And um, mm. I kind of just like, I didn't really have anything else to do. I was in basically like a cast from my wrist or my hand, like the middle of my hand all the way up to my shoulder. And it was like kind of bent. And I was in that for about 12 days or so. And I just couldn't move this arm for real. So I kind of told myself, I was like, I want to learn something to do. Like, I don't want to just like sit around and watch TV all day. I want to like kind of be active, still move around. And I had just like some tennis balls in my room. So I was like, I'm gonna learn how to do two ball juggling with my left hand. I mean, I, I knew I wasn't really that good at it. So I was like, I'm gonna kind of learn. And I started doing it with my left hand and, and I got a little bit better as the days went on, but I just kept doing it every day. And once I got out of this cast, I found that because I was so sharp with my left hand and because it was just muscle memory, when I got back with my right hand, even though there was some fatigue, I was still able to do it like I'd been doing it every day. And it kind of like, taught me and it trained me just that like even when you're not physically working towards your craft like in a specific right, way so mentally hard, your mind so is hard. like your mind is all pieced together and your body is still yeah. working and growing and getting stronger but it's just that that mentality to actually be able to like have that discipline to do those little things that like you think are stupid but in reality mm. like when everything pieces together mm. it's not stupid at all and i mean i, I i'm glad that you were ab actually able to take that and like use that for your benefit because I mean, in me telling you that that's what I was hoping that it would do. I mean, in the end of the day, like I talk with a lot of these, these like world-class decathletes and stuff. And they're, they're saying like what they've done it for. Some people say they were in it for the fame and for the money and other people are like, Oh, they were in it to kind of inspire and to, to, I guess, motivate. I mean, I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I don't care a thing about the money that comes with the sport. I don't care about the fame. I don't care about the titles. 100%. What I want to do and like down the road is like, I hope that me being able to express myself in my own way on the track will motivate somebody else to, to join or start the decathlon or to continue with the decathlon. Or if they're on the edge trying to decide if they really want to do it or not, them seeing me or something that I do actually motivates them to continue to do it. And I mean, just, just hearing that you take certain stuff that I've said to you, man, it, it may, it makes me feel, feel pretty. Like, I don't even know the right word to describe it. It just kind of makes me feel happy. And I, I appreciate you for sharing that yeah, with me. I'm glad we could, we could kind of share it and talk about it because that's, that's just some cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, like, honestly, like I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest advocate advocate for that. What you're talking about doing the little things that, Seems stupid in the moment, but yeah. like literally day, days after my surgery, I'll be standing in my driveway, like holding my javelin, like holding my shot, but mm -hmm. not doing anything with it. Just standing there holding it like, damn, like one day when I'm going to be able to throw this thing, like I'm mentally going to be ready to throw it. Right. I'm sitting here preparing for and it. That's so. like one thing we always talk about is my, where the mind goes, the body follows. Mm -hmm. I live by that. Like it's just, it's just how it is, bro. Like I'm sure we started the podcast. Yeah. Like, I dude, literally like that motto right there is just like exactly what we started. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like wherever your mind will go, the body will follow while he's like, like while you're taking, you're, you, you're injured and you're thinking about it like all the time. It's just like, you're going in the right direction already. Mm -hmm. You're building muscle memory. Like it's just all going the right way. Right. Yeah. I love that so much, honestly. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. 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 I think you have any more to touch up on that. No. All right. I think, um, one last question mentality um who motivates you um i actually have a few people that motivate me um uh if we're just talking about hurt like just regular motivation just somebody that kind of has that mentality and i mean for lack of a better term that mamba mentality um 
the late Kobe Bryant. I mean, everybody I think can can agree with me in saying that he was one of, if not the most dedicated athlete that was there was when it comes to just that mindset of just attacking and killing everything. Um, but also just knowing what it takes um, in in the off in the off time or behind the stage or back backstage or whatever you want to call it to to get the results that he was really working for. I mean, I, I watch a lot of his old videos or I watch a lot of motivational stuff involving him and everything. And, and I just kind of see that the mindset that he took every day in life, kind of, I, I find myself taking that same exact mindset when it comes to training or on days where I wake up, I have to get up early and I don't want to run, but I think about a certain thing that he said, I mean, just kind of drives me and it fuels me to just keep working and keep driving to, to be the best in the end of the day. I mean, so I, I definitely look at a lot of Kobe stuff. Um, I'm always looking at Ashton Eaton stuff because he was the world record holder when I first got into the sport. And he's just a guy that I really, really look after. I mean, his speed, um, his jumping ability, every, everything about the way he competes and just the way he keeps himself super calm and relaxed in the moment. But at the same time, just the, the type of person he is off the track, like he's not super boastful he's not super loud and rambunctious and rude and and everything he's a really nice guy he's always looking to motivate somebody he's always looking to to inspire someone and just doing everything for his community so just everything that he does the type of person that he is is just i i i attribute a lot of a lot of my success and the hours behind of me being actually on the track to to him and just everything that he's done within the sport and just growing it. I mean, for me, growing my love for the sport, just watching him and everything. And lastly, my biggest motivator, I, I would have to say, is my dad. I mean, I had mentioned earlier, I started track when I was really young at seven years old. And from seven till um, my senior year of high school, right before I went to college, my dad was my coach all throughout that time. And I mean, it was just day in and day out work with him, whether we were actually on the track for practice or at a meet or just sitting in the house kind of talking numbers or talking track and, and just kind of staying engaged and motivated. Like he never lets me lose sight of where I'm going. I mean, he believes, and I call him right now, like he's, he's my sponsor, like anything that I want or I need that that'll get me to, to being on that next level, like he's going to provide for me. And I com completely understand that. And I totally appreciate him for doing that. But he he believes more than anyone else that I'm I'm where I belong in the sport. He believes that I'm one of the best, if not the best, out there right now, and I have the potential to be the best to ever do this sport. And I mean, he keeps preaching that in my head, and and he allows me or figures out ways to motivate me and actually get me to believe that same thing. And and I I pay huge tribute to him and and all that we have done over the past eight. 10 plus years in this sport, 10 or 11 years or however long it's been in this sport. I, I really pay huge, huge homage, huge tribute to him and, and how much he's, he's impacted my career. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like we're very alike with that. Like my dad is obviously my, you know, biggest motivator and mm -hmm. stuff. And it, we're very similar in ways. Like my dad was my, you know, coach when I was younger, all the way up to high school, coached right. my high school team and stuff. And, and, you know, at some point, like my dad, like needed me to see someone else, like, someone better. So I went to see, I don't know if you know who Glenn Thompson is, but he coached Joe Kovacs and, um, and, uh, Kyle Long and a few mm -hmm. guys that went, you know, were pretty good. So Brian Whiting as well. Okay. But, um, so I, uh, it's funny, like you, you said like, you know, your dad sponsored you, like, you know, he, whatever you needed to be, get that next level, like he would do for you and get for you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is like, so like similar to me. Cause I remember times in high school, so my dad's a paramedic. So he, um, he would like work a night shift on Saturday, drive back home from New Jersey and pick me up in the morning and then drive me two hours away to Harrisburg to see my coach. So he was like not sleeping at all overnight. Mm -hmm. He worked night shift, you know, just to help pay for stuff, you know, help see my coach. And mm -hmm. he would drive me all the way out there the next day. So I just see my coach. Right. Like that's the little things where I like the little things like that mean so much to me. Like right. the reason why I'm out here now is because I saw that coach. And it's because my father did the most so I could be like that. You know what I mean? Right. So I get what you're saying totally with your your, your pops, like yeah. how he's your biggest motivator. Because I I feel the same exact way, bro. Sometimes I just want to do it for him. Like, this one's for you type of thing. You right. know what I mean? Like, right. so right. I just want to, like, you know, make him proud. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously I share the same, same sentiments as you guys. My mom, too. I mean, 
not getting too much into it, but I, I grew up with type 1 diabetes. My mother was amazing for me, um, sacrificed everything. And same as you guys, I share the same, same sentiments. Yeah. I want to do it for them, bro. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how it would be. For sure. But, um, yeah, we really, we really appreciate hearing the, uh, the, a little bit about your, your mentality. It's, mm -hmm. it's not every day we get to hear from a athlete of your caliber and a man of your caliber. Right. So it's always, always super unique. Um, but we kind of want to get into some non-mentality related questions, kind of yeah. get a little update on, on how you're doing and, and what's going on in your life right now. Cool. Um, so you want to get started on? Yeah. So like you already know, we're going to ask you, but how do you feel about, um, people calling you best athlete in the NCAA? You know, um, you know? I've, I've definitely heard this, definitely. this type of talk before and, um, like I said earlier, like, I said earlier, like I'm, I'm not I'm, really. I'm not fueled or driven by those accolades or those those types of talks or whatever i mean but at the same time like it's cool cool to know that some people see me in that type of way and it's cool to kind of have that title but at the same time like <clears throat> being the best athlete in the ncaa is not what i told myself is the goal i told myself that the goal is to be the best athlete the best athlete to ever do it which means breaking a world record which means being at world championships, which means winning those meets, which means winning an Olympic gold medal and such like that. So until I actually have accomplished that, I feel like I'm just on the right path. And I mean, I think being considered one of the best, if not the best athlete in the NCAA is a step to get to being the best ever. And I mean, that's, that's definitely a cool feeling to know that I'm checking off one of the boxes that I put on my checklist. But until I get to that final check box on my list and I can just put a nice check through it and just set that paper to, to the side or whatever and hang it up. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be fully satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> I mean, like I mentioned to you before, them Georgia pool players got it now. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, honestly, Spots you know what I'm saying about? There, there's say. probably some old linemen that don't clean more than you. You know <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> like, yeah, they probably weigh that and they can't clean it. So, hey. That's all I'm saying. They, they yeah. probably look at your Instagram and be like, yeah. damn, like, so, I'm, I'm in my bag now. So I, I got another question. I got another question, though. So mm -hmm. we're talking about all the, all the lifting, the cleaning. Everyone's seen it, the Olympic lifts, the, the the crazy mile times. Like, would you ever consider doing CrossFit? Like, it seems like you might have a bit of a future if you if you made a little transition after track. You know, I, I definitely would consider it. I've actually um, watched some, like, CrossFit competitions and stuff and kind of, like, done a yeah. little research on CrossFit and it definitely looks tough. It definitely looks like a challenge, but you know, I'm always up for a challenge. And I think after I'm done with the sport and I'm kind of just like sitting down enjoying life, I'm going to want to stay in shape and CrossFit is going to be a great way for me to be able to do that. So I don't know if I'd actually enter myself into any type of competitions or anything, but I definitely would dabble around with it and kind of like find a CrossFit gym and maybe become a, a member for, for as long as I can after the sports done. So. Just gotta keep, gotta keep the physique looking good. Yeah, so. got to, got to. It's, it's, it's like y'all doing the little physique thing. I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna not body, but I'm gonna go power lift or something. Go. Deadlift. <laughs> keep it simple. Yeah. I'm gonna like lift like, like kettlebells over. Yeah, 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 yeah some like stupid stuff like that, dude. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one of my questions would be the playlist. Let's hear it. What, what do you listen to before me? The playlist for me. Um, it changes depending on how I'm feeling going into a meet. I mean, it also kind of depends on the stage that I'm in in my warm up process. If I'm in the beginning of my warm up, I'm on the warm up track and I'm just kind of like getting my body ready. I want the juices to flow. I'm listening to a lot of like hype, hype stuff, just stuff that I can like move my head to have a nice beat. You know, I listen to a lot of NBA Young Boy, Young Thug. Meek go. Mill, I mean, you gotta, he's a, Meek Mill's a hometown oh, hero for me, you know. You know, I didn't even think about that. Of course you listen to Meek Mill. You gotta, go to Q and Dreams and Nightmares real quick. Gotta listen to Meek Mill, you know, because. That's gonna fire you up. It, it definitely. I mean, every time, that's, that's always. Chills, the, bro. The Meek Day playlist, but, you know, I'm, I'm always listening to super hype stuff, um, <clears throat> just when I'm in the warm-up area, but. When I get to, about to go into the call room, I either like to listen, to slow it down a little bit and listen to maybe gospel i mean i'm a i'm a man of god i grew up in a under under a pastor my dad uh was a pastor for 15 plus years and such so i grew up believing in christ and i like to listen to gospel just slow it down and kind of relax my heart rate a little bit but kind of still keep my energy and, and keep everything flowing or i'll just take my headphones off but i think the craziest thing um that i've listened to before and that i listen to here and there is people people call me insane for it if if 
they hear that I'm actually li listening to it. But um, sometimes I listen to the Purge comm commencement speech. And the reason for me doing that is because um, a lot of people think that because we're not a contact sport in track and field, you, you're not as aggressive. But to be the best, regardless of whatever sport you're playing, whether it's football, basketball, wrestling, track, tennis, whatever, whatever you want, golf even. I mean, you you have to have that killer mentality. It's not just like a mentality of, oh, I'm the best. You got you got to kill or be killed. You got to eat or you're going to get your food eaten. You feel me? So, like, you, you just can't leave stuff laying around. Like, if, if there's a if there's something that you want, you got to go get that for yourself. It's not just going to be handed to you. You got to earn it. And, and hearing that just – even though it's not me physically going in there and just slaughtering people, that's the mindset that I want to take because everybody that I'm competing against, regardless of if it's, if it's my training partners, regardless of if it's the the greatest decathlete ever, say I line up against Kevin Meyer at a at a certain championship, I'm I'm gonna treat him just like I treat everybody else. I mean, you you're somebody that's trying to take something that I want, and I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to take what I want, whether you have it whether it's in my possession or whether it's just laying right in front of the both of us, I'm going to do what I need to do to take that from you so I can have it for myself. So that, that kind of fuels yeah. me to get to that point. So if there was any doubt as to if he could step on the Georgia football field <laughs> and put some other boys on their ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it, is that... <laughs> he can do it. He can do it. I was, um, I was at a practice maybe a couple months ago. Um, it was, it was after I had my hamstring injury and I was kind of just getting back into the flow of running. And um, we were training in like our little indoor facility or whatever, doing some sprints. And some of the football team walks by and then the coaches walk by afterwards and I'm just chilling there or whatever, doing a sprint, don't have a shirt on or whatever. And one of the coaches comes up to me, he's like, dude, like, you try, you try and play on a team? <laughs> I'm trying like, to just like laugh it off. He's like, dude, I don't. It's not like a power five school. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know why you're laughing. SEC like, yeah. we just had some players get drafted. Like, you're trying to come play outside linebacker for us. I'm like, no, nah, I'm cool. You can talk, you can talk <laughs> with Petros about that. Yeah, <laughs> Petros yeah, not letting me go I'm... anywhere. But you know, I mean, pe people definitely notice the size. I mean, I, I would say I'm a, I'm a big dude. I'm even though I'm a decathlete and I gotta kind of like stay a little bit lighter. I still am six five and weigh two hundred twenty pounds, which is a lot bigger than. Mm -hmm. like, than a lot of these football players out here, especially at certain positions that I would consider playing. So, I mean, if I wanted to go out there, I could, and I definitely have the mentality to go out there and, and knock some people on their ass, you feel me? But, I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, dude, honestly, I'd be thinking about it too. Like, cause, <laughs> damn, I, I'm 6'5", 315, oh, bro. Like, <laughs> you know I can go out there and play some O-line, bro. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? My heart, my heart says tight end. I want to go out there and catch the ball. <laughs> you know what, today? It's not running anywhere with that. After, today, I come out of the weight room after my lift. I, I got this, like, tight like, weight track shirt on. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm looking hockey, right? <laughs> Some two fuck is there, like, damn, imagine him at, at linebacker. I was like, linebacker? linebacker? I'm like, bro, I weigh 315, bro. I can't play linebacker. You got me the old line. He's like, nah, you, you look like you weigh 280. I was like, damn, I'm flattered. 280. It's that nah, cut you've been on. Yeah, trust me, it ain't 280. It's because I've been eating salads recently. That's why I was going <laughs> 280. But damn. Yeah, yeah so just, um, just the, the last thing we, we wanted to touch on, we wanted to give you the chance to uh, promo yourself a little bit. Um, here's some NIL stuff going on. Uh, obviously, big new ruling in the NCAA. Yeah. Um, so anyth anything you got going on you want you want to mention? Right now, I don't have anything that's out yet, but I'm definitely in the works to kind of start building my brand a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of working with a few people to do some brainstorming on probably some merchandise that I want to drop out just to kind of like build my so, brand so, a little yeah, bit more awesome. for myself personally and kind of just to get the decathlon out there a little bit more because not too many people, I mean, n know or have respect for the decathlon. So I kind of want to like grow that event in the sport and just globally, I kind of want to grow that and give it a little bit more exposure. So I'm trying to brainstorm some stuff and talk with a few people, just kind of like getting my brand out there. And so definitely be on the lookout maybe within the next half a year to a year for maybe some merch that might come out and, you know, we can, we can there give you boys a discount or whatever, you know, feel like. <laughs> yeah. we we'll that. That. Hopefully we still do this podcast and drop a little promo code. <laughs> yeah, we got that. That's what we I'm got, saying. Uh, Kyle Garland's, uh, 
uh, new brand. We'll drop a little promo code. Yeah. T Kitch is the best. Love but, it. Uh, nah, Love yeah. It. Love it. Yeah, so um, honestly, this is great. Thank yeah, you no, so much for uh, really coming appreciate on. Your time, bro. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. you having me, man. Yeah, it was, this is awesome, honestly. So, everyone, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. And uh, you're going to spend. Oh, you got something else? You got something else? God bless. God bless. God bless. Dreamers Mentality, signing off. Peace. Thank you. Appreciate it.